All right, I'm Brad Neal. This is Chemistry 150. Let's have a conversation about the types of bonds. So we've talked um, in class about things like electron configurations now. So hopefully you feel okay uh, in regards to at least the uh, fundamentals for writing out electron configurations. Um, and this nice little table shows what the valence shell electron configurations are going to be uh, for different elements. The thing about the valence electrons that makes them so powerful is that they are the ones that are involved in chemical bonding. Um, and so because now we have a way of recognizing which electrons are involved in bonding, it's time to start talking about bonds. So let's get on with it. Um, so the kind of bond that's going to exist between two atoms is going to very much be dependent upon the kind of interaction that's happening between those two atoms. Um, and the punchline of that, um, and if you can keep this in your head, uh, you'll probably go pretty far in chemistry land. Mother Nature is lazy. My old high school chemistry teacher used to say that all the time, and he was absolutely right. Mother Nature is absolutely lazy. She's going to configure atoms and have them interact in ways that allow for the lowest amount of energy to be spent when bonding. Um, so we're going to configure atoms uh, in molecules in a way that minimizes that energy. So to do that minimization of energy, we're going to focus on three kinds of bonds. Um, the first one is ionic. The second one is covalent. Within covalent bonding, we have two individual types of covalent bonds. We have what are called non-polar covalent bonds. And then we also have polar covalent bonds. The last kind of bonding is metallic bonding. And uh, of the three up here, metallic bonding um, is either the most interesting if you study that or if you don't study that, uh, it's the most boring. Because metallic bonding is really just the bonding that holds atoms together in metals, like in big bulk metal stuff. So it's not that it's unimportant, it's just it's kind of boring. All of these are really just descriptions of the kinds of interactions that exist between atoms. Um, and to say that these are like individual discrete uh, kinds of bonds is incorrect. Um, so what I mean by that is like with this discrete thing, you could say that you um, your statehood is... Indiana, like you are a resident of Indiana, or you could say that you are a resident of Ohio. Um, don't know why you would do that, but you could, even if you were from Ohio. Um, that was a joke. The in that regard, your statehood is a discrete thing. You're one or the other. With bonding, it's just this kind of continuum, um, and we draw these imaginary lines in the sand. Where we say, ha ha, this kind of interaction is ionic, and this kind of interaction is covalent, and this kind of interaction is metallic. But you can just kind of really imagine this like a triangle, this continuum, um, and like you could say, well, this particular molecule happens to land in this portion of the triangle. If it happens to land in that portion of the triangle, we're going to say it has more ionic character than it has covalent character. But at the end of the day, it's it's just a bond. We're using these terms to help uh, describe to one another the characteristics that these have. So when we say ionic bonding, we're describing the general properties of the bond. Um, ionic bonding is going to come from electrostatic interactions. Um, specifically, we're going to take those oppositely charged ions that we've talked about since chapter two, and we're going to say, hey, 
ionic bonding is what holds ions together. Um, and it's that electrostatic interaction. And I've mentioned it in Chem 150 before, Coulomb's Law. Um, I, what I've never done before is really shown an equation that goes along with that. And we have an equation that goes along with that, where Q here is going to be uh, some indication of how strong the interaction is between our two um, species of interest. So if we look at this equation, the Q here on the far left is going to be that interaction strength um, equaling a constant multiplied by Q1 and Q2. And Q1 and Q2 are going to be the ionic charge for species 1 and species 2. So if we do a hypothetical and we say like something like sodium chloride, well, sodium ions have a plus 1. And so Q1 would be plus 1. Q2 would be negative one, so one times one, and then divided by R, and the R is the distance between uh, the ions and nanometers. So this is really technical, and beyond homework problems, you don't really use it a ton unless you get into higher order chemistries, um, because we just generally say in general chemistry, ionic bonding is very strong. That's how we normally say it. And we, we should, though, from this equation, be able to take from it that the strength, that Q over here on the left, will be bigger if we have particles um, like ions that have stronger charges. So the interaction between something like calcium sulfide, so where calcium has a plus 2 and sulfide has a negative 2, well, that's a 2 times 2, so 4. That's a bigger number here in our numerator which should make the Q here on the far left bigger, which we would say then, okay, that's a stronger interaction between a plus two and a negative two ion compared to a plus one and a negative one ion. Does that make any sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this is an equation, like I said, we don't really use a ton of, unless you're in that field of chemistry specifically. I um, mean, we're not in that field of chemistry in general chemistry. This stuff, though, we're going to use it a lot in general chemistry. Um, and this is covalent bonding. Excuse me. Um, so covalent bonding is a class of interaction. Um, and we break it down into uh, the nonpolar and polar covalent bonds. To be able to tell the difference on an intera a covalent interaction and whether it's a nonpolar or polar covalent bond, we have to know what the difference in electronegativity is between the atoms involved in said bond. So if we're going to know what the electronegativity is, we have to know what electronegativity means, what it is. And it's in the reading and a really truncated definition of it is it's the ability of an atom to attract um, electrons to itself um, when that said atom is in a molecule. Um, and this has a bunch of different things at play. Um, so if you have a bigger nucleus, um, you have more protons in there, per, depending on the size of the atom, um, the reading um, and that worksheet that I've given out in class had things like shielding and otherwise into consider you know the into play um, shielding would affect your electronegativity a bit. Um, I'm going to show you a periodic table that when you just accept the periodic table as it's written um, and the trend, it makes this stuff way easier to understand. The a key punchline to keep in mind is going to be this uh, final dash. The bigger the difference between the electronegativities of two atoms in a bond, the more polar the covalent bond is. So let's talk through that a little bit. Okay, so this is that table. Um, and this was based loosely off of, or not loosely, fairly a good bit by some work that uh, Linus Pauling uh, did. Um, 
so let's talk a little bit. The general trend for electronegativity is that electronegativity increases as you go from the left to the right on the periodic table. It also increases as you go from bottom to top on the periodic table. So the darker purple something is, the more electronegative it is. So the general trend is left to right, you become more electronegative. Bottom to top, you become more electronegative. Now you might see these numbers uh, on this table. The numbers here, um, there was some science, and we don't need to get into that explicitly, that came up with these numbers, and they're but they're all on a relative scale, so they're all relative to one another, um, or a base uh, measurement. In essence, what we can do is we can say... Um, Let's do a molecule of uh, fluorine, for example. Fluorine, we've said, is a diatomic molecule. Fluorine has uh, electronegativity on this table of 3.98. Well, if fluorine is a diatomic, there's just the two fluorines there, the difference in electronegativity between the fluorines is going to be zero. Right? Because fluorine subtracting fluorine, it's, it's the exact same number. So no one atom in a diatomic fluorine is going to be stronger than the other. Because one's not stronger than the other, we would say that that molecule is nonpolar because there is not a great difference in electronegativity. But if we go uh, and we do something that's a little bit more crazy... So let's take something like hydrogen fluoride, so HF. Well, now with hydrogen, we have a value of 2.20. With fluorine, we have a value of effectively 4. The difference between hydrogen and fluorine is pretty high. It's about 2. What does that tell us? Well, because that difference is pretty big, we're going to be able to say now, oh, there's a large difference in electronegativities. This is probably a polar covalent bond if it's forming a if it's forming a covalent bond. In this case, it pretty much is. Um, so because of that definition of electronegativity the fluorine has a higher electronegativity. That would say that between the hydrogen and the fluorine, when we form a bond using our valence electrons, the fluorine has those valence electrons around it in the from the molecule more than the hydrogen does. So this difference here gives us an indication of covalent, uh, the strength of a covalent bond. The stronger, or I'm not, I'm sorry, let me scratch that. What this does, this difference is gives us an idea of whether we'll have a polar or nonpolar bond. A bigger difference in electronegativity would be a more polar kind of bond. Now remember that continuum thing that I was talking about with ionic versus covalent bonding? So how does that come into play with electronegativities? It does. Let's take, for example, that sodium chloride that I talked about earlier. Because we say sodium chloride is an ionic species. Well, chlorine says 3.16. Sodium is 0 0.93. The difference between them is, give or take, around 2. That's a pretty big separation here in differences in electronegativities. The bigger the difference, at some point in time, we're going to trip over that line that we've decided exists. And we're going to say, okay, this is no longer a covalent, polar covalent bond, but rather it's an ionic bond. 
So in essence, my without getting into the math of it, um, the general rule of thumb that we've talked about previously in chemistry still works. Something from the left-hand side of the periodic table interacting with something from the right-hand side of the periodic table is usually going to be an ionic compound. Two things from the right-hand side of the periodic table are going to be covalent compounds or co uh, covalent molecules. So this electronegativity is just a uh, another layer to help us rationalize the things that we've already discussed in class. We just previously said, accept this, and now we're starting to describe it a little bit more. Does that make any sense? Yes. Is there, is there like, like a, a, I don't know, a number threshold for if you know some things polar or nonpolar versus like when it goes over to being ionic? That's a really good question. Is there a threshold from whenever you're going to say, okay, it's no longer nonpolar and now it's polar and then from polar to ionic. Um, let's get, let's talk through an example of specifically a carbon hydrogen bond. So carbon on the table here is 2.55. Hydrogen is 2.20. We typically think, uh, at least in general chemistry land as the carbon hydrogen bond as being effectively nonpolar. Um, yeah, there's a difference in electronegativities there, and by strict, strictest definition, nonpolar would mean there's no difference in electronegativities. But 2.55 minus 2.20 gives you around 0 0.3. That's really close to zero. So most of the time, we're going to consider that to be a nonpolar bond. Um, that doesn't give you a hard and fast rule like you want. Um, but generally the closer to zero, we're going to consider it more of a nonpolar bond. Um, and for general chemistry, it's usually going to be fairly clear, um, as to whether it's going to be a polar or nonpolar, uh, kind of bond that's happening. Um, something like a nitrogen and a hydrogen. Now we have a difference that's getting closer to one. So 3.04, 2.20, so it's like 0 0.8. Um, we would say that that's going to be more of a polar um, bond because of the difference in electronegativity. Um, so from polar to ionic, there's depending on how you want to um, talk about it, and I can't remember if your book has the diagram in there or not, because they talk, uh, sometimes people talk about hydrogen fluoride and whether it's actually an ionic compound or if it's a covalent compound. Um, and the thing, of, because the difference in electronegativities is just so big, right? It's like around two. Um, and we said that the difference in electronegativity between sodium chloride um, or chlorine is really big. So that's probably, that's best thought of as an ionic compound. In general, uh, I think it's for the non or for polar versus ionic bonding, it's better to think about where the species are on the periodic table. Is it a metal with a non-metal or is it two non-metals? I think that's your best indication on whether it's something that's going to be um, typically classified as ionic versus uh, a polar covalent bond. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. That's a lot of words. Sorry about that. 